Hey everyone, uh, today we're going to talk about model agnostic interpretation beyond SHAP and LINE. A uh, few words about myself, I manage the TLV data science team at Bluevine, which is a fintech startup that helps small and medium businesses in the United States get the financial services they need, a bank account, loans, and debit cards. Uh, and in the data science team, we work on various uh, business problems uh, while utilizing machine learning techniques. So, for example, uh, we assess the client's uh, risk before uh, getting a loan. Uh, we identify fraud and we analyze client's behavior uh, in order to help with uh, marketing and sales uh, initiatives. I have a master's uh, degree in statistics from Tel Aviv University, and I'm interested in predictive models and their interpretation. So some decisions models can make. A uh, loan is rejected, patient is sick, and suspect is guilty. But why were these decisions made? Uh, humans need explanations in order to trust machine learning models. So for example, if a loan is rejected due to low income, <clears throat> then this reason makes sense. But if a loan is rejected due to the client's zip code, this might indicate there might be bias uh, in the model. And if a loan is rejected due to the distance from the owner to the business being minus 200 kilometers, this reason indicates there might be a bug in the distance feature. So this is a nice uh, chart I found that uh, illustrates the trade-off between accuracy and interpretability. So you have uh, models which are highly interpretable such as linear regression and classification rules, uh, but are not very good at uh, making accurate predictions. And on the other side, you can see that neural networks are making very accurate uh, predictions, but are very hard to interpret. So some available approaches uh, for interpretation, uh, two of the most popular interpretation methods are LIME and SHAP. Uh, LIME offers only local explanations, while SHAP offers both local and global explanation and also has a sound theoretical base but its inner workings are difficult to understand without a proper background. The approach we'll present is simple to grasp and based on common human intuition, as you'll uh, see just in a bit. So LIME stands for Local Interpretation Model Agnostic Explanations. Uh, here, a linear model is trained in the vicinity of an individual observation and it serves as an interpretable model for the specific prediction. Since slime stimulates observations around the original one, it can't handle binary features or missing values. In contrast, CHAP stands for Shapely Additive Explanations. And the idea behind CHAP is calculating the contribution of each feature to a prediction by utilizing concepts from game theory. It required training models on all subsets of features. And uh, you can imagine this results in a huge number of sub-models. And so this is approximated um, when implementing uh, the method. And also, since proper mathematical background is required to understand the method, the interpretation method itself becomes a black box to the end user. So before diving into my suggested method, I want to spend a few minutes and for, try to formalize how do humans uh, reason. I will discuss a few concepts from the Book of Why by Judy Pearl, who is a prominent computer researcher and um, philosopher in the field of causality. And we'll start with a simple example. Uh, the rooster always crows before the sun rises. Uh, can we infer that the rooster's crow makes the sun rise? Of course not, but why? Uh, we have a mental model of reality, and we know that if the rooster wouldn't have crowed, the sun would have risen anyway. 
And this is a counterfactual. Uh, counterfactuals are the common way in which humans make sense of reality. Uh, it cannot be scientifically proven. Uh, think of uh, Descartes' uh, demon. This is a thought exercise uh, in which uh, Descartes um, describes two events, a, event A that causes event B, but he basically says that you can never prove that there isn't some evil demon that uh, causes event B to happen right after event A. Um, so you can't um, prove uh, causality uh, in principle, but humans will reason this way anyway. So it makes sense to try and formalize this process. An interesting concept from uh, Pearl's book is uh, the ladder of uh, causation, in which the lowermost level is association. We saw that the roosters crow and the sun rise uh, at the same time. And the next level is intervention. Basically, it uh, answers questions such as if we give patient A a drug X, uh, how many months will he live longer? This is not something that we'll go uh, into in this talk. Uh, we'll discuss only counterfactuals as I've already um, described. So how is this idea of uh, counterfactuals were a, was um, applied in Blue Vine? Um, I'll describe Blue Vine's client risk model. Uh, one of our predictive models is aimed for an assessment of the client's risk when they apply for a loan. And using historical data, we predict the client's level of risk and divide it to six different risk groups, which we call bucket. So um, the lowest risk level uh, is called A, and it goes up to the highest risk level, uh, which is F. Why do we need interpretation uh, to begin with? Uh, so we need it for multiple reasons. Uh, first one is to develop the model and select features. The second one is to sign off on a model with business stakeholders for which we'll need a global explanation. Um, business stakeholders want to make sure that the feature we're using are not introducing bias and uh, they make sense um, business-wise. Uh, so this is something that's uh, important. And also when an individual prediction was made, the person who reviews the decision needs it to make sense. Uh, so for that, we'll need a local explanation. So our interpretation approach is counterfactual analysis. What we're basically doing, we're simulating different features values and recording the change in the prediction. So for example, you have a feature of a delay in payments in which the original value for a specific entity was 21, uh, 21 days of delay in payments. Um, that resulted in an original prediction of C. But when you change uh, the value of this feature to zero, uh, you see that the new prediction is A, which means that the client's risk level uh, improved uh, following this change. Um, another example, a credit score, uh, the original value uh, might be 800, uh, the original prediction will be B, but if you reduce um, the feature's value to 650, you'll have the new prediction uh, of the risk level deteriorate to E. The first generation of uh, Blue Vines risk models was for new clients, and it was developed by Lena Stuchewski, who is a senior data scientist at Blue Vine. In her model, she used only binary features. So you have a feature that uh, uh, calculates, for example, the client's income uh, is between 10 and 20K. Uh, the original value was true, and the original prediction was C. Uh, you change um, the feature's value to false, and you see that the uh, prediction goes uh, to A. And this setup allows for a counterfactual analysis without knowledge of the feature's distribution. 
Um, in the second generation, uh, the idea was later extended in the Bluevines model for repeat clients, and the features were not solely uh, binary. They were both binary and uh, numeric, and both local and global explanations were constructed. So how did we construct local explanations? A, a local explanation is aimed to explain a single prediction and each feature's value is replaced with a median in the representative population. And that can be either the training sample or a large group of current clients. And the feature that caused the largest change in score was chosen to be displayed in a textual explanation. So let's go over some code uh, example to see how this um, idea works. Uh, we start by uh, initializing some objects, uh, getting the model's features, getting a, an original sample, original predictions, and a dictionary of features to median. So for example, we have uh, feature one having a median of four, feature two having a median of 455 and you initialize an all prediction data frame with an empty data frame. You then iterate over tuples of features and medians uh, in the dictionary that we constructed. And uh, we start with an alternative sample. Uh, we list the feature we're currently working on as a changed feature and we replace the feature's value with the median uh, that we're currently uh, in the loop for. Then we get the predictions on the alternative sample and we concatenate the results. After the loop finishes, we calculate the biggest change per entity and this is what we're returning to the user. So how does this output uh, look like? Uh, as I mentioned, it's a textual explanation and it has two versions, a short one for a quick review and a detailed one for an in-depth analysis. So let's go over two examples. Uh, the first example, short version will be a longer delay in scheduled payments deteriorated the client's risk level. And a detailed version will be client had 21 day delay in payments compared to a median delay of zero in the population. This caused the client's risk level to deteriorate from level D to level E. Another example, a short version, higher credit score improved the client's risk level. And a detailed version, the client's credit score is 800 compared to the population median of 650. This caused the client's risk level to improve from level C to level A. Now let's go over to global explanations. Uh, how did we construct these? So a global explanation is aimed to explain the feature direction uh, in the model as a whole. Uh, in this case, individual feature values are replaced with the one extreme value, which can be either the fifth or the 25th or the 95th, sorry, uh, percentile. And the changes in the scores distribution are calculated and visualized. So this is an example of a visualization we had. Uh, it uh, describes the direction of a bucket change when increasing the feature value to the 25th percentile. So each bar here represents one feature in the model. And for example, uh, the first feature you see here is length of delay in payments. And you can see that when you increase it to the 25th percentile for all clients, you have uh, most clients have their risk level deteriorate, which means they are riskier. So how does this uh, conforms with our mental model of how risk works? Um, we can uh, intuitively uh, assume that when the clients are uh, making their payments in delay, they uh, suffer from a higher risk of entirely defaulting on a loan. So uh, it makes sense that uh, this feature will deteriorate the client's uh, risk level. Uh, but again, this cannot be proven. It's just um, something that we compare to our mental model. Uh, some features have mixed effects. So for example, you can see that the monthly balance increase feature 
uh, causes a few clients to uh, deteriorate the risk level and a few others um, improve the risk level. So this might indicate there's some interaction with other features. For example, uh, leverage uh, is the amount of money that you have in your account that it results from loans such as mortgage and uh, car loans. And maybe uh, for clients that have their risk score deteriorate, it might indicate that there's some interaction with uh, leverage. And this is something that I would look further into. Another feature, um, that behaves uh, in another way is the uh, years since incorporation. Uh, basically, how many years uh, has this client be been in business? So you can see that for most clients, if you increased the years in business, you can see the risk level improve, uh, which again makes sense if you think that most uh, businesses, uh, if there have been a lot of year, if they, they were a lot of years in business, um, so more stable behavior and are less likely to default on their loans. We have a similar plot for a direction of a bucket change or a risk level change when reducing the feature value to the fifth percentile. So here, the first feature you'll see is the balance in your account. So if you uh, reduce the balance in your account, you'll have a uh, risk level uh, deteriorate for a lot of clients. And on the other hand, if you reduce your leverage level, you'll have your risk level uh, improve. Again, these are uh, directions you, you can think about and uh, see if it makes sense that these are the directions in which uh, these features will, um, will affect. Some additional points uh, to consider. Uh, full interpretation requires the features to have uh, some meaning. Uh, we're talking uh, in this talk on a model that uh, models uh, uh, clients' behavior. And so the features themselves are uh, inherently uh, meaningful. But even features by themselves are not meaningful. The framework is still helpful in identifying possible bugs. Um, another thing is that the global interpretation has an implied assumption that the features impact is monotonic, which is of course not necessarily true. But the framework does give a hint to the causal relationship and provides insight into the reasons behind the prediction. So uh, to summarize a uh, quick comparison between the, the methods, uh, the scope of explanation both in SHAP and uh, our counterfactual analysis is uh, both global and local, when it, when, while in Lyme it's only local. And both SHAP and the counterfactual analysis can handle binary features and missing values, while Lyme can't. And, and I think that the most important uh, point here is the method uh, complexity. Uh, in our counterfactual analysis, if you understand percentiles, then you understand the method. Uh, you already have your intuition of how counterfactual analysis uh, is done, and you basically don't need anything else to understand what's going on there. Um, in contrast, uh, Lyme uh, requires some uh, information as to how linear versus nonlinear models work and SHAP need extensive mathematical knowledge and a, a knowledge of a game theory. Um, so that's it. Uh, thank you for listening. And I'll be happy to hear if you've worked on similar projects uh, in your uh, job and what was your uh, experience with it. And I hope you enjoy the rest of PyCon. Thank you. <laughs>